send them off to them. If you really want to literally save a life, this is a good, a great organization to partner with, and we're grateful that they're here in Rockford. This morning, we are continuing our series on prayer. So if you were here last week, this laid some foundational verses for us. Today, we are turning to the passage which most of us are familiar with, and we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer. And the passage we're turning to is in Luke, so if you do have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 11. The one, if you've memorized the Lord's Prayer, is from Matthew chapter 6. That is the longer version. We are looking at a shorter version of Jesus' teaching on prayer with some interesting nuances that I wanted to bring up to the surface for us this morning. The hope is that during this series, during this message, the prayer is, that each one of us would be um, equipped, that we would be encouraged, that we would be empowered, we'd be informed, we would be motivated to continue to deepen and strengthen and widen what we do in prayer. God has set it up that prayer is how he interacts with this world. And we have a privilege of connecting with him in conversation through his word and expressing to him. It is powerful, it is profound, and it matters. So this is a very vital and important topic. And so we're going to look at how Jesus taught us this morning. And this passage itself could be a nine or ten part um, series, but we're going to pull to the service some things that I believe will be helpful for us. First point is this. (laughs) Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed. So let's look Luke chapter 11, starting with verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. We're going to pause right then. Now, has it ever struck you that Jesus prayed? Now, if you think if there was anyone on the face of this planet that could handle what was coming to him that day, it would be Jesus, right? Why did Jesus need to pray, right? I know I need to pray because I'm weak, I'm feeble, I get confused, I have limited power and resources and energy and on and on and on. But Jesus prayed? I want that just to settle in to your mind. And if Jesus needed to pray, and he did it intentionally, if you read the Gospels, you see often there are times in which Jesus went alone to pray. We read it over and over and over and over again. Now, if Jesus did this, needed it, modeled it, made it a priority on his very demanding schedule. If you think you have demands, try to be Jesus, right? He made it intentional, consistent, practical. Jesus prayed. How much more do we need to pray? Now, in the Bible, I'm sure that when the disciples were physically with Jesus, they asked him questions. But I want you to know that there's only one question that is recorded that the disciples asked of Jesus. Now, they didn't ask him, Lord, teach us to do miracles, which would have been cool. They didn't ask him, Lord, Teach us how to build a big, strong church. They didn't ask them how to be, teach us to be godly men or to be fantastic fathers or to raise our kids well. What we have recorded is this one request. Lord, teach us to pray. 
I believe that they asked him this important question because they understood that his prayers, his time with his father, in that shaping time, all of the other questions were answered. They asked him, teach us to pray. And they heard him pray. They saw him pray. They experienced the responses to the Father answering those prayers. Prayer was important to Jesus. Prayer was important to the apostles. So much so that they said, we need to have time in prayer to give ourselves to prayer. It is important. It is powerful. And we as Christians believe it's important. But we have to ask how active, how engaged, what's happening in my life, what's happening in your life when it comes to talking to our Father. The first thing we want to look at, that one, Jesus prayed. And second, this was an important question that the disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Second Primary point this morning. Jesus taught us how to pray. And I want you to personalize it. Jesus taught you how to pray. Luke chapter 11, verse 2. He said to them, When you pray, assumption there that we will pray, and it's the assumption that if you are Christ follower, you will pray. He says, now when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. And the nutshell, that is the Lord's Prayer. And again, in Matthew chapter 6, we see a more expanded version of this. But in this version, it covers the primary elements to prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but typically I pray to God. And I've been thinking about this and trying to address when I pray, Father. Now, if I call out to God, it's not like, well, you didn't use the magic word, Father, I'm not going to listen. Of course, he'll hear you. But this teaching to call him Father matters. By the way, in the Old Testament, they rarely address God as Father, if ever. But when Jesus came on the scene, he prayed to God saying, Father, every prayer we have recorded of Jesus started with Father, except one. You know what prayer that was? My God, my God, why have you? forsaken me. Let that sink in where he was on the cross where God, his father, separated himself from him. Jesus at that point felt, knew the separation and cried out, my God. Versus the closeness of a healthy father-son relationship. Father. When you think of God, the Father, I want in your mind that to be a connection. You are known by Him. He knows you. A healthy relationship with the Father. It's been meaningful to me when I go to prayer to call God Father. And it puts a different spin on it, at least for me, instead of God more formal addressing, 
its father, a more familiar addressing. One who knows me, one who cares for me, one who is connected to me, one that I can know, one that I can care, one that I am connected with. Jesus taught us to use this familiar or um, term of endearment. Father, this is a privilege that we have as his children. I have two daughters, and they call me dad. If they're in a weird mood, they'll call me father. <laughs> but they're the only two alive on this planet that could tell me this, call me this. And when they call, if I can, I will definitely make room. When you call your father, he makes room, quote unquote, for you. The privilege that we have, not a distant God, but a God who is near, who says, call me father, for this is what he is. And this Prayer should not be just prayed as some of us have been taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? You guys know it? Amen. Right. No, this is the pattern. And sometimes we don't have time to pray this pattern. Right? You didn't see the Apostle Peter when he was walking on the water. Remember that? We didn't say... Our Father, he didn't have a, you know, 10, 20 minute prayer time. It was, Lord, help, right? Sometimes that's all we have time for. That's all for prayer. Do we do that anymore, by the way? It's a question I have to ask myself. It's a question I ask of this church. It's a question that I ask of the American church. We typically pray well when we're in danger, right? Or when we're in need. We typically pray well then. By the way, God sometimes allows those things to happen so that we draw near. But do we spend time, set aside a time for prayer. I'm not sure. Because often it's a drive-by prayer. God, thank you for this day. I got lots to do today. And will you help me? Amen. Right? You guys know what I'm talking about. This, let's be honest. Right? I typically skip the first part. I'll go to, give me this day my daily, what I daily need. God, help me to this day. La, 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 la. Thank you. Boom. Right? Skipping the adoration. <laughs> Skipping my need for forgiveness. I don't want to talk about that. Right. Skipping that God will need, would you help me to forgive other people? I'd rather be angry at them than forgive them. I want God to help me today because, you know, prayer is about me. And then, I don't know. I don't want to think about temptation either because obviously I am godly enough to get over any temptation there is. Thank you for that laughter. <laughs> you understand this here. Father, first thing is this relationship. Second, hallowed be your name. That word, like, what is hallowed? Like, hallowed? Like, really? Do you ever use that term anywhere else? <laughs> Never, right? What does that mean? Lord, may your name be set apart, be glorified this day. That's in essence what it means. I recognize that your name is holy. Right? What a powerful name it is. Right? The name of Jesus, the name of Yahweh, the name of God our Father. May you be seen as separate, holy. May you be honored, May you be glorified this day. How often do you think in your prayer, do you pray about God's glory? Probably not very often. 
God, through Christ, instructs us to draw near and to pray, God, may you be glorified today in my life. May you be honored in my life. May you be honored in my family, in my home, in my workplace, in my community, in my school. That is a powerful and profound prayer that doesn't start with our need, but starts with God's glory. Do you hear me here? Reorientates our mind. Saying, Father, Hollywood, may you be glorified this day. God, may you be honored today. If you think that way, you will live differently. And may your kingdom come. God's perfect and holy will be done. Where heaven intersects with earth and we see God's kingdom be established and expanded. We're praying for that. Again, this is beyond our needs, and it's important to bring him our needs. But beyond and above that is God's, our relationship with him, God's name being seen as holy, set apart, glorified, and God's kingdom would intersect with this earth. This is what we pray for. These are powerful things to pray about, and you can just slice this thin, and you can spend time on just these things, talking about how good God is, talking about how you look to glorify Him, talking about His kingdom. Thirdly, we come to give us, each, uh, give us each day our daily bread. Do you need things today? The answer is, of course, right? And by the way, this daily bread harkens back to an Old Testament time. Have you ever heard of this thing called manna? Have you ever heard of this? what sustained the people in the desert. It came every single day. Now, God could have just set it up, go and collect all you need for a month, go, go back and put it in your cooler and you'll be cool, right? Or just, it'll be fine. He didn't arrange it that way. He could have. And the Israelites tried to gather more than they needed for that day. It got maggots in it and went bad. Besides on the Sabbath, by the way, God gave him two days. Just another sermon. <laughs> God gives us this day what we need for this day. Give us this day our daily bread. This is where our needs come in. God, I need wisdom today to dissect and interact with this issue. God, I need your presence to open the mind of a person I'm going to talk to. God, I need strength this day. I need your love today because I don't have it. I need patience today because I surely don't have that. God gives us opportunity to ask for what we need, and he responds to us. For Forgive us our sins in verse 4. Right? Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins. This is right relationship to God. Now, I try not to sin, right? But I sin every day. Either by commission, something in, intentional, or omission, something that I left out. Right? Granted, we are all in process, and granted, God, help us to live in a way that is righteous and right and beneficial, and full of love. But we fall short. And so we want to, rem to confess our sins. God, forgive me of my sins. Puts me in the right orientation so that I can now forgive others of their sins against me. Has anyone ever sinned against you? Yes! Yes. Thank you, thank you. When we understand that we ourselves are, are sinners, and it makes it a lot harder for us to be self-righteous with other people. How dare they? Before I get to how dare they, I have to look at me and says, how dare you? <laughs> and then I say, God, thank you for forgiving me. And out of the forgiveness that we've received, we can therefore forgive other people. You understand this? It's 
powerful. Often we brood and we meditate and we think about our woundedness versus seeking Christ and his forgiveness. There's a difference. This will help your soul put us in right relationship with God, right relationship with other people. There is a ton of woundedness in this world. And Jesus himself instructed us to be right with God and to forgive everyone who sins against us. A lot more to be talked about there. We'll move on. And lead us not into temptation. Now, this isn't God like saying, ooh, I can't wait to lead you to temptation today, right? And because we prayed it, he won't lead us into temptation. That's not what it is, right? God does not tempt anyone. Does he test us? Obviously. Are you tempted? Yes, every day. So do you think that you would be more equipped to resist temptation if you prayed about it beforehand? Yeah. God, help me not to give in to temptation today. That is a powerful prayer. And often in our flyby prayers, right, heading out the door before meals, right? And often we think, well, I pray before meals, I'm a prayer. <laughs> Are you? Hey, that's a little heavy handed. I'm just saying. I think Jesus prayed a little bit more than before meals. He prayed consistently. I'm going to say in the morning. Why in the morning? Because if you're praying for this day for your daily bread, you're not praying for that at night. Right? You already lived the day. Prayed about God's glorious kingdom. Prayed about being connected to him. Prayed about the needs of the day. Prayed a right relationship with God and for other people, prayed about the temptations that would surely come that day. I want to challenge you this. I want to challenge you to take this passage. What month? We just started May? Take a month. Take this month. Well, that's a lot. No, it's not. You can't do a month. Do a week. Start tomorrow morning. I'm asking us to sit down with this passage. If you want to look at the Matthew 6, go right ahead. I am in this passage. I want you to get up in the morning. Before you normally get up in the morning, set your alarm clock a little bit earlier. 15 minutes. Take this. I want you to think about it. And then I want you to pray through this. I don't want you to just recite it. I want you to pray through it. I wonder what would happen in your life if you did this for a week. I wonder what would happen in your life if you did this for a month. I wonder what would happen in our congregation if we committed to do this. I wonder what would happen in Rockford, in your neighborhood, in this world, if we decided, God, we are going to give ourselves to you in this way. I bet you we'd be different. I bet you things would be different. I bet you are situations we'd see more of God working. So this is what I am asking you to do. Pray this with me in the morning. Whenever you get up, get up a little bit earlier and pray it. We have to continue. Third thing. So what I'm just calling the pass-through principle. So after Jesus taught these things, now he went on then and expanded on what they asked him. And this is, we see when we pray for other people. Now notice a few things here. This is Luke 11, 5 through 8. Then, after Jesus taught them this, Jesus said to them, Now suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight, right? No one wants a knock on their door at midnight. It's never good news. Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, Hey, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A different friend of mine who's on a journey, just arrived at my place. They're hungry. They need some help. 
and I don't have anything to give to them. Verse 7, and suppose the one inside answers, hey, don't bother me. The door is already locked, but fly. And my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. But I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, but because of your, and I like how the NIV translated this, shameless audacity. (laughs) Good job, NIV. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Okay, So understand this. You have one friend who has a need who comes to you. And you have another friend who can provide for that need. And these two don't know each other. And so, you and I, as a go-between, as a intercessor, as a networker, as a connector, see the need of our friend over here. And we ask with shameless audacity, for the needs of our friends. Will you provide for this person? Give to me what then I can give to them. Will you help this person out? Shameless audacity. Now when my dad was alive, I didn't ask him for much. But I felt weird about it. But I know when my kids had a need, and they really needed something, computer, help with the car, God bless them, right? Had a real need, I shamelessly asked, not for my sake, but for their sake, hey, can you help because this will benefit my kids? I had no problem asking for them, but I had a problem asking for me, right? Maybe you do as well. So here's the deal. When we are praying for other people, the Lord's Prayer, we are praying with a relationship with God, and then we have situations that people we know have needs. And then we have a privilege because we have a friend in God, in Christ. We ask Him, hey, will you help this person? Will you help this person? Will you give to me so that they can get what they need? I want you to be shameless about that. I want you to be bold about that. I want you to be persistent about that. This is why we ask each other to pray. It's more than about being informed of what's going on. It's saying, hey, will you ask your friend? On my behalf, I have a need. Will you ask him? I'll say, yes, I will. Because I love you and I... Know him, and he loves you. This is what Jesus is saying. When you pray for for other people, it's a pass-through principle. God, will you supply, perhaps, to me so I can give to them? Ultimately, will you supply what is needed for them? And I am asking you for this. We need people who pray boldly with shameless audacity. Love that phrase. Shameless audacity. We'll pray for those in Africa, saying, God, will you help provide for us so that we can provide for them, right? Come on, Jim. We'll ask for that. I will ask you for help to help them. Do that for your family. Do that for your friends. Do that for this girl, right, that's coming up. Pray for Karen. Pray for her. Pray for this girl. On behalf of this child. God, will you make a way for this child who is in the throes of life and death? Pray these things. Jesus said, pray these things. And lastly, we have a promise of provision. So I say to you, verse 9 of Luke chapter 11. Now this is connected, by the way, look at the context here, connected in praying for your friends. So I say to you, ask, and by the way, the Greek is this, 
Ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking. The door will be open to you. For whoever would ask receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. There is a promise of provision there. Why is there persistence? I think God uses it as an opportunity to show our love and our consistency and our tenacity. How often do I ask and say, well, he didn't answer the first time, right? If I want someone to come to the door and I have an urgent need, I ring the doorbell. I don't just wait around. I ring the doorbell again, right? And then I start knocking on the door. And then I start knocking on the door. And I start knocking on the door. And then I blow up their cell phone. Right? right? You, got, you know how to do this? When's the last time you prayed like that? Charles Spurgeon has this quote passed on me by, Lu- by uh, Lee and Susan. Whether you like it or not, asking is the rule of the kingdom. (laughs) Asking is the rule of the kingdom. And this was by the prince of preachers, which we heard about last week, who understood the power of prayer. This is how it works. And God will respond and give you good things. He continues on. And I'm going to conclude here. Luke 11, 11 through 13, Jesus continues to explain, connecting through the pass-through principle, connecting that if you keep asking, he will respond, and then saying, which of your fathers, which of you fathers, excuse me, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you're evil, thank you, Jesus, doesn't mess around. He was talking to his disciples, by the way. We're only good because Christ makes us good. Even though you are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? What is good, and this the Holy Spirit is a gift that keeps on giving It's not going to give you something that will harm you, ever. Even though often you pray for things that will harm you. God, help me to win the lottery. You know you've prayed it. Thank you for laughing. I prayed it too, okay? Oh God, there'll be so much that I can do with this money. I promise I will give you it all. He's like, yeah, I know you. I know. Oh, please, 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 please. (laughs) Buy a new Corvette. The point is this, right? When we ask him, he will respond. In particular, we're asking for other people. And yes, he will give you what is good, what we most need, what is most valuable. 